Okay, you're good whenever you want to go. All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, please stand for the saying of the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, led by our student representative, Marissa Zarcone. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Marissa. No problem. All right. Um, I like to uh, ch turn over to the public hearing right now for the uh, public employer health emergency plan. And Allison can talk a little bit about it. Okay. On September 7th, 2020, Governor Cuomo signed legislation requiring public employers to create plans for future dis state disaster emergencies involving uh, communicable disease. Employers are required to draft and publish a contingency plan for the next global health crisis. The plans are to be submitted to unions for feedback, which has been done in this case in our district and need to be finalized by April 1st, 2021. Uh, tonight's public hearing opens discussion for this plan and there's a 30 day comment period. The plan is, uh, will be available on the web's page. That's all I have today. Are there any qu questions of the plan uh, by any of the board members? No. All right, upon the close of this hearing then, I we will have a 30 day comment period and we take action upon it after the 30 day comment period has expired. All right, uh, superintendent for the legislative update presentation. Great, thank you. I will uh, give Mr. Kraleski a moment here to get that up for everybody to see. So a couple Saturdays ago, we had the opportunity uh, meeting the main NOSBA, uh, Niagara Orleans School Board Association, and our superintendents in that group that are part of that group to present to um, our legislators about um, where we believe we stand in New York State with regard to um, financial assistance and what the expectations are and have been from school districts. In essence, here's what we said. Um, we know, and I think everyone can clearly see what the expectations are and what the needs are for our communities, what the expectations are for our districts to provide to our communities. And, and what we're asking for from our legislators is to make sure that the monies are there and available for districts to provide what our communities expect us to provide for, for our communities, okay? And we had an opportunity to speak with our legislators. We believe it was very well received. I do wanna share just quickly what we believe some of those very clear needs are, and then also talk about what's happening uh, financially, both within our state and, and, and nationally, okay? So if you look at this slide here, um, the, the, the first one has been so glaring and so obvious to people in New York State um, and throughout the nation with regard to the digital divide, meaning there are students who have very little access to technology, maybe zero access to Wi-Fi connection, which puts them at a serious disadvantage when it comes to um, their, their counterparts in the academic world. And we're asking the state to invest long-term in both technology and Wi-Fi access for our school communities. The governor did recently in a state of the state talk about that. It was actually one of the few key issues he talked about with, with regard to education. Um, so hopefully that is something important moving forward. We know that student health, uh, mental health has been um, something that's more expected in our schools, not less expected from our schools. So uh, we expect there to be consistent and adequate funding for those, for those categories. 
boy, um, school nutrition has never looked more important than it has during COVID, right? We realized how many families really um, count on that food and particularly at the heart of this crisis, we've made sure and we were asked to make sure that we would fund it. Now, what some people don't understand is that they've withheld some of that money that was supposed to be paid to us in the form of reimbursements for food that we, for the money that we spent on food from last school year. We're saying to the state, you asked us to provide this, you need to reimburse us. We did just receive today um, some information that at least all of the grants that we have for this, this school year should be fully funded at the end of the year. That's the expectation. They didn't give a timeline, but that's only that was only grants. It didn't pertain to all of the other funding that has been withheld from our districts. Okay. Now, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to funding. Next. Um, I've said this probably the last five years, universal pre-K is not universal. We need it to be universal. We need to make sure that every student who wants to be part of our pre-K program can be. And we also ask that kindergarten become mandatory. Students who do not attend kindergarten in many cases really struggle to catch up. They end up in remediation for reading, for math. So that is a very important um, topic, I think, for most districts. And, and it should just be, we believe, should just be standard. Uh, pathways to graduation. We need flexibility, not just during COVID. We need flexibility. If we believe that, we, that students should be able to pursue many different avenues for their future careers, we need to make sure that they all don't have to fit into the exact same 22 credits. So we need more flexibility there. Uh, school safety, whether that means you want a school resource officer, whether you wanna better fortify your, your facilities, uh, there should be flexible grant funding that's annual for districts. Um, the last item on here is a really important one in our district and our neighboring districts. Student enrollment has gone down, but the expectations with regard to what schools need to provide have only gone up. And, and we've continued to see that in our district, we've seen that in our state, we've particularly seen it during COVID. Um, we, as, as schools, as, as a hubs of the community, we're happy to take that on. All of these challenges, all, but we need to make sure that the finances are there to support it. Okay, next. Um, this is where I say aid needs to equal expectations. If there's an expectation that we're gonna provide certain services, we need to make sure that the funding is coming back. Um, we need it to be dependable and predictable. The state should not be withholding funding at this point. Remember, the federal government has passed two stimulus packages, one from last year, one for this year. That money is to plug the holes for education. There's plenty of money coming from the federal government to New York State to fill those holes for last year and this year. Next year is a different story, okay? But, but this is really, really important that everybody understands. That money's there. Now it's up to our legislators to make sure that it gets to the, gets the school district districts to plug those holes. Um, a really big one, it was a, it was a serious um, issue talking point when the executive budget came out last year. And it's a problem again this year. See, every year school districts spend money on things that we don't have a choice. I'll give you an example, special education services. And we have to spend, we have to make sure that we're meeting requirements of things like individual education plans. That funding can fluctuate greatly from one year to the next, right? It can go up and down. 
Therefore, the state historically funds school districts in the following year based on the money that they spent in the previous year. What our govern governor has rolled out a second straight time is an executive budget that takes all of the expense-based aids. I just gave you one example, but there's many. Putting them all into one category and no longer funding them based on what districts have to expend. Okay, so if we have to drive our kids to school on buses, we expect to be aided for how many runs we need to go pick up kids and bring them back. The governor is attempting to just add small percentages or zero percentage, or maybe even go backwards by combining all of that into one budget line that no longer is based on what is expensed. We last year put together a spreadsheet of for our for the districts in our BOCES, and the long-term financial impl implications of that would be so significant to our region. So we've asked our legislators to make sure that it's a non-starter when it comes to negotiations. The good news is we did hear some at our legislative uh, update meeting with our legislators say it is a non-starter. So we'll hope uh, that they're able to make sure that that's the case. All of those lines should be separately broken out and districts, our district should receive aid based on what we have to expend. Um, under federal aid, there are, uh, I mentioned the two federal stimulus packages that's, that's been very good news or is very good news for districts. We're gonna talk a little bit later about our tax cap. Um, the, the, the percentage is, um, I, I would say low this year considering what the needs might be, but uh, we'll, Allison will talk about that a little bit uh, later. This, this slide, and we'll, we'll put these slides up for everyone afterwards. This just goes into some of the detail about some of the things I highlighted with regard to um, the, the, the stimulus packages. Dan, if you could go on, please. This talks about the second one. You can go ahead. Okay. So just a few of the questions out there, you know, when will school districts see CARES Act dollars from New York State from the 32720 Federal CARES Act? Because we haven't seen it yet. In essence, what they did is they put money in and took money out. And in the governor's current budget, he did the exact same thing. In other words, his budget proposal for next year, he has one line that says, um, we're taking out money, the same amount as the federal government he's expecting to put into the district. So guess what? There's no new money going into the district from the federal government. It's, well, it's only federal dollars. He's going to take out the same amount in New York state dollars as he puts it in federal. That's part of his plan right now. Okay. Um, how and when will New York state share Get, get its share of the current $82 billion relief? And will New York State Legislature allow the governor to, to again offset any budgeted COVID-19 with another budget run line item? And this is what he's calling, it's this pandemic adjustment. In other words, he's putting money in, taking it out. I look at it kind of like a shell game, right? Where's the ball it's behind one of the shells? The, the money's being put in under one of the shells and then it's being pulled right back out. Our federal government acted to make sure school districts had money, that the money is to be given to school districts. And I don't believe that they expect the state governments to pull out more of their money and use it for something else, more of their state money. So, um, you know, that's kind of the uphill battle that we're, that we're fighting. Um, the governor's proposal um, was a flat line proposal when it came to foundation aid for districts. In other words, no new dollars in foundation aid. And that is the one area that districts have the most control of with how we spend it. So that's two years in a row that his proposals have been flat. Okay, um, next. This just shows what I was talking about. You can see the federal cares restoration and then the pandemic adjustment 
you can see money going in. It doesn't matter which district you pick, but you can see them. If you look at ours, Niagara Weed Field, you see $584,000 going in and you see $584,000 going right back out. Somebody see that? Okay, next. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, if you could go to the next, this is just a breakdown of all the districts, but if we just look at ours, um, you can see the monies um, that were expended um, by our district, our reopening costs this year were about $1.6 million. That was money that we did not have budgeted. We've had to do that within our budget, which has made our budget very, very tight this entire year. A lot of things we couldn't do um, so that we could do what we are doing. Um, but you can see 2020-21, the proposed 20% state aid reduction, the 2021 proposed 20% reduction for pre-K funding for our district. Um, what we're saying is fully fund us what, what was expected for last year and this year. And then next year, we're asking our legislators to make sure that they do much better than the flat foundation aid amount that is the current proposal of the governor. Next. And I actually did touch on a number of these. We'll, we'll make the rest of this slideshow um, available uh, to our to our public. As I said before, you know the the, la the, the, the last item here on this last slide. Um, oh, right here. Thank you. We know we're only allowed to have a four percent carryover, or excuse me, a four percent increase on our fund balance. There's. Um, We've asked for increased ability to utilize our reserves, but quite frankly, we dug into our reserves pretty hard last year and expect to again, that's where we need more state money. So we're not utilizing all of our savings. And then the last one, you know, as, as superintendents, as we sit around and talk about this, and I know board of educations are really concerned about this as well. We've had this awful, pandemic, right? This, the, the, this pandemic that has taken many, many lives. I'm really worried about the academic pandemic, this learning pandemic that's coming next. Um, there are many students who have not received the same education as they did, as they did before. For our district, that's more particular to last school year than this school year. But still, we all know that you know the virtual program, they're not the same. So we're looking for, and we've talked about additional funding for summer programs, for additional remediation, so we can make sure that kids who have fallen behind have the opportunity to get caught back up. And that will certainly be part of the things that we'll talk about when we talk about our budgeting for next school year. Allison, anything you wanna chime in here? Right. Um, no, uh, actually, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, fund flexibility and some of the things we are allowed to do later in the financial piece. Um, as I'm looking to build a budget, um, I need to discuss with the board the use of one of our reserves for a particular purpose. So, no, other than that, you know, I... Um, as you discussed, you know, the, the aids being combined, you know, the one big thing that's really going to affect us is the fact that we're buying new buses and the aid on that bus, those bus purchases would drop right off if that were to happen. So it would really, it would really kill the whole plan as far as, you know, the, the bus purchases over, over the years. So I don't know. I'm just praying that that doesn't happen again this year. And just, that's just such, Alice, I'm sorry, that's just such a great example. If you just think, simple math, just think of a $100,000 bus. When we purchase that bus, we get about $70,000 back on that bus, okay? We don't get it the next year, we get it over what, 15 years, 10, 15 yes. years? Yes. Okay, but, but we get that money back on, on, on the bus. 
So 70 something grand, make yep. it 80. Cause instead of, instead of getting that number back, if he does it this way and you get a 2% increase on your transportation spending, just take that hundred thousand dollars. You're getting 2%. Anybody doing the math really quick? $2,000, right? Yeah. 2,000 is 2% 2 of 100,000 versus how much? 70 something, $80,000? 70,000. Yeah. Buses are not an option for districts who have to provide transportation to our kids. That's, so that's in the budget, Dan? I'm sorry? That's, his, that's just one of his proposals? Correct. So Dan, that would affect all the buses we already bought? Mm -mm. I don't think that they would do it that way, Bob, but you know, because, <laughs> you never know. because we're at a certain yeah, age, that's that's, I don't even know, I don't even know what number he would start at other than right now what he's done is he's, he's compressed all of the different eight amounts into one category and you'll just get a 2% increase on that. So it has nothing to do with what your expensed expenses are to receive so would, the expense based aid. It would be impossible for some districts and us down the line included to be able to manage a budget because with the tax cap yeah. limitations, we can't just tax the public for those losses and we wouldn't have the reserves to make up for it. Did we buy the five buses in 2020, Allison? We, or did, Dan? we, we buy, yep, seven. seven We've been doing about seven a year. year. Yep. So we bought them in 2020 already. Yes. Have we turned the fleet over since we started this? Uh, no, not yet. Not right? Yet. Because because if we were doing about six, about seven a year, I think we've been doing for the past five years. Yeah. We've turned over 35. I, I know you were like at six or seven, maybe four. So we probably turned over 40, 50 buses, but the fleet's like 72. Oh, okay. Okay, so we Thank figure you. every 10 years, we'll turn them over. So we're getting close. Any other questions on any of that? Not good. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Let, let me just put a little, little ray of sunshine here. If our legislators do what we expect them to do and come in with a proposal significantly higher than what the governor did, we could be okay. But they know that that's what we need from them. And they know that we need them to look at the dollars that are coming in from the federal government differently, not as a substitution for them. Hey, Dan, where would we be? It should be, they it should be that we should use their language back at them. And that should be supplement, not supplant because they tell us that all the time. New York State should be supplementing, using the aid from the federal government to supplement, not supplant what they were going to use it for. Sorry about that. Yeah, where would we be if that, you know, they didn't, you know, put in and then take out like that, you know, the, the dollar? We'd be in, we'd be in, in a, a much decent, better place. Uh, we'd be, we'd, yeah, we'd be, in a much, we'd be in a much better place. It's, it's, it would be back to normal, I, I guess. Well, exactly. no, no, because because remember the last couple of years, the foundation aid part they've been flat on. Yeah, too. it has increased, right? Yeah, so so it's a it's 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 a compounding thing. Now, again, the government, the governor's proposal has been flat. The legislature have not. So right. I want to be fair about that. Hey, Dan, whether you um, politically are the legislators that represent us are trying to do what what you said. Do they? Do we know if the legislators that represent the people in the New York City area uh, are they on the same page with us, or you think they could be taken care of separately than us? There's always a big difference between upstate and downstate, no question, Rick. It's there's a divide. They, you know, they 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 benefit very differently. Remember, there's districts in, you know, in and around the New York around the New York City area that they almost received zero state aid. So, um, you know, almost all of their money comes from their, from their tax base. I mean, there's, so the, it's just it, very different. 
Um, so they, they root for different things. They push for some different things. Overall, though, the legislature over the last few years has been um, much, um, much better for public education financially than the executive's budget and the governor's budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, was it Rockland County? I think the average uh, um, state aid is like 2%. Yeah, it's for the whole budget. 98% is taxes. Any other questions for the, for the superintendent on the uh, legislative breakfast presentation? Can, oh, can I just make one comment on that? I'm sure. sorry. Because you just brought up a really good point that ties in. Remember, and this did, helps answer um, Mr. Suriani's question, I think, too. So if, if, if the scenario that Mr. Sabo just set up, if you're in one of those districts, you're not getting the same level of like expense-based aids. You're not getting, so you want it all to be in different categories. You want it all to be in foundation aid. You want it all to be in, you know, so he, what happens is the fight isn't about the amount of money. It's about where the money goes. So do, do I believe that the governor really hopes to combine these, all these expense-based aid and have them go out the door? No, I believe he thinks he throws that on the table and then bargaining starts to happen and it gets, they, he has to give it up, but then he gets something in return, right? Because I haven't heard a legislator say, it, certainly not in our area, but that expense-based aids is that that's a good idea. Let's, let's get rid of it. Especially once you explain to him what it means. Thank you. Okay. All right, since there's no other questions I hear coming through, I'm gonna move on with the agenda. I will move on the consensus agenda items. I'd like to call for a motion to accept the consensus agenda as submitted. I'll make a motion. I'll second. All right, any items to separate or discuss and vote on separately? All right, then all those in favor of accepting the consensus agenda items, please say aye. 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 Opposed abstaining. Motion carries. I had to call for a motion to accept the personnel report as submitted. Take a motion. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. Any item to separate and to vote on separately? Or any no. questions or this, uh, on any of the items listed in there? No. Nope. Um, just because I know it's now we have some uh, besides sports because of sports being in uh, we do have the musical uh, appointments there. Do you want to uh, well, do you just want to touch on what the direction the musical is going to go on this year? Yeah, as of right now, it's going to be a um, completely virtual musical. Uh, the, the students will obviously work in, in concert with their with the directors and, and other adults who are working to, to put, put together the production. They haven't selected what the, what the production is going to be yet. Um, if at some point um, th th there's an opportunity to allow um, you know, spectators for sports, we, I can imagine that we would do something similar for, for a musical, depending on what they produce and you know, where it's better to be seen and how it's better to be seen, okay? But, but I, we're really excited that um, that our students and teachers have an interest in putting something together um, for uh, for a virtual musical, and um, once they see how many kids are interested, they'll, they'll have a better understanding of what musical uh, they're going to choose. It's pretty exciting. Very good. All right, then. All those in favor of uh, accepting a personnel report, please say aye. Aye. Um, aye. Opposed are abstaining. Motion carries. All right, Capital Project Committee, Bob. Yeah, Capital Project Committee, um, we have a, on our agenda, we're gonna have a meeting on March 3rd at 4.30. Uh, what we're gonna do is discuss uh, alternates uh, to add back into the project. Due to the cost savings we had from our last project, now we're, we're able to now add some of the different alternates back in um, to this project going forward. So we're gonna meet on that March 3rd at 4.30, it'll be virtual. I don't know if you can at the end. That's it, great. 
All right, perfect. Uh, policy committee. Julie? We have our next meeting scheduled for February 17th. So two weeks, I believe from today. And I believe five o'clock, does that sound right? Five, five o'clock. So uh, we have a few policies to review. We'll probably have those on the next meeting or the meeting after. All right, perfect. All right, fundraisers as informational items is listed as our communications to the board's area. Let's take a chance to look over those. Um, ex officio student uh, members report. Uh, Marissa? Yeah, so basically in the high school, a couple like updates and stuff. Um, one thing that's pretty nice is um, sports started on Monday, the new like winter sports season. Um, and that's, you know, and we got the dates for the next few seasons too, which is exciting. We'll be able to finally like see some people use the new turf um, other than soccer. So that's pretty, pretty nice. So hopefully everything goes as planned with that. Um, also, um, I don't know if it was just me, but like today, like it was like, you know, with the start of the um, second semester, like I noticed my classes were a little bit more filled, um, which is kind of nice. Like it's weird being in a classroom with like three people in it and just your mask on and no one talking. It's nice to have some more kids in the class, um, you know, make you a little less awkward, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. Um, and also, um, I know like Student Council and National Honor Society have been doing a lot of stuff in the high school um, and getting more kids involved. And that's just really nice to see that um, this year. Um, and I also just kind of wanted to like bring up some like senior stuff, I guess, because we're kind of nearing the end of the year. Um, so we found out a couple weeks ago that um, Tanawana Castle, which is where we were supposed to have our prom, canceled. So that kind of changed everything with that, which is kind of to be expected, you know, like having 300 kids in a hall, it doesn't really seem realistic right now, but it's still, you know, kind of like opened our eyes and made us realize like, oh, like this is happening. You know, we have to come up with new ideas and figure stuff out. And in a year like this year, it's really hard to do. Um, but I know like the officers had a meeting with like the administrators in the high school, just kind of like talking and coming up with ideas and brainstorming. And they were, they were really supportive and like understanding, but it's just difficult because there's so much uncertainty and like so much we can't control. So any ideas that we do come up with, you know, it's not really, we don't have any power as to what happens. So we're just trying to keep coming up with ideas. And as of right now, it's kind of just a waiting game. Um, I know like a lot of people have questions. They want to know like about like graduation and those kind of things, but obviously we don't really know. Um, but I don't know, last year, the seniors, um, obviously everything went crazy for them too. And they seemed to really enjoy it and everything worked well. So we're pretty hopeful because, um, you know, we have more time to plan and figure things out. And um, yeah, I just wanted to like mention all that because we are like looking for input and suggestions and stuff. Um, just like, you know, let people know what's going on with that. Um, but yeah, we're trying and, um, you know, with a year like this year, it's hard because we haven't really been together at all. We didn't really get homecoming, you know, going to football games. Um, so we really want to like figure out a way to get together and just to celebrate everything we've accomplished. So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there too. Um, so yeah. Marissa, where is the where is the senior class on uh, discussing like uh, graduation and you know what their what their thoughts are on it? Yeah, so I don't really know like what I, if I'm supposed to say this stuff because I don't know it's like not. Hey, do you, Marissa, do you want me to jump yet, in? But, <laughs> Marissa, do you want me to jump in? Can I save you? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me just just um, Mr. Uh, White and I are gonna probably have something that'll go out to families, um, hopefully by the end of the week. If, if I, we have it on our calendar to get together tomorrow, so. Um, with the idea, and, and I think, Marissa, you laid it out really well, it's all about contingencies, right, at this point, and contingency planning. So um, at this point, one of the things that we don't know, and I don't want to get into too much detail until we lay all this out, we already have dates and stuff. There, there's really four potential different dates for even something like graduation based on a couple different factors. Do we have regents exams or don't we? Right. And 
Are we allowed to have large group gatherings or aren't we? So those two items will, would determine like four different dates. New York State has put out in for a waiver again for the state exams. If that goes through with the federal government, we'll be down to two dates. I feel much more comfortable giving our population two dates, you know, to, to go with rather than four. Um, so, but if we don't hear anything in the next day or so, we'll probably still put this out and just say to families, hey, here's what we're looking at. These are four dates. Hopefully, you know, within a few weeks, we can get it down to two, but mark your calendars. And um, I know uh, my understanding is informally, Mr. Pogel in his sociology classes has kind of got a little bit of a survey from, from some seniors about which they would prefer. Forget even what we can do. Like, do we want the art park or do we want what we did last year? I know that that's been a discussion there. I think what we would probably do, depending on how our choices are narrowed, um, is just put it out to our seniors and say, tell us what you want, right? So um, that's where we are with, with, with graduation. I did have a couple, I've had a few conversations with um, Mr. White. I've spoken with Mr. Pogo as well. And um, I know that they've been talking with the kids. So is that, does that sound fair? Person. Yeah, I feel like one thing is, you know, getting like the student's perspective. I know parents always have a lot to say, but I feel like it's really important that the students, you know, end up getting what they want. You know, let's be a little selfish, you know, kind of like. This is about you. What you want. So right. I feel like that's important. And also just like getting together, you know, like however it's possible. Um, in a year like this, you know, we go to school every other day. You don't see half the class. So it's just it'd be nice to be able to do something, not big, yep. but nice to celebrate everything. Yep. Well said. All right. Um, any questions for our, other questions for our uh, student ex officio member? All right, uh, presence report. There's two things I asked the superintendent, uh, two questions that came to me that I've asked him to touch on. One was dealing with um, you know, the concerns that parents have brought up about the fans, uh, the lack of fans at sporting events. And the other one was to clarify the comments made by the, um, the governor in regards to what the, his view of opening schools during one of his interviews was. Uh, right. So I, I'm gonna ask him to respond to those two items. Right. First one on spectators. I, I hope people had a chance, <clears throat> excuse me, last Friday, I did send out a, a letter to the middle school, high school families, uh, letting them know um, my take on um, where we're at. So everybody understands section six has decided that February 22nd is the date that they'll revisit, allowing spectators in. My, my feeling is a simple one. Um, we need to step into the moderate and high risk sports slowly. We need to make sure that it can work for our student athletes because that's who we care about and want these events to happen for. Um, what, what I don't and would really not want to see is that we forced a bunch of spectators in and now we can't control COVID and our coaches who are also our teachers can't come to school because they're quarantined or even worse, have COVID themselves. And then we can't get staff to fill their positions. If you remember at the high school not too long ago, we actually had to close down the high school because we didn't have substitutes. So we walk a very fine line this year with subs. Subs, is, subs are always a problem, but more of a problem this year. And, and, and as much as I love athletics, we cannot allow our desire to have our, our um, parents there impact our student athletes ability to participate. No one wants that. Okay. So I think they made the right decision. Section six did by waiting till February 22nd to make a decision. Um, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll be able to open it up a little bit. I will tell you, it's going to be more of a challenge with some sports than others because of the venue size. 
our middle school gym, which we utilize for some of our basketball, is a lot smaller and there's no seating for fans. Our swimming pool area can only fit so many people. And once you get two teams in there, we might not be able to have spectators at all. So, you know, everybody has to, you know, be, again, continue to be flexible with that. Um, and, and again, for the most part, I think our, our school community has been really great with this. So, um, the second question was what, Mr. Sabo, if you could. Uh, with regards to the governor's statements about fully reopening schools uh, during the interview that he did, and what exactly are, you know, the, the thought of that is in regards to, um, you know, applying to the different states of schools in New York yeah. State. Thank you. Thank you. Within the last couple of weeks, statements have been made both at the state level and the federal level about reopening and fully reopening in the spring. Okay. I don't know what they're, what they mean, what they're referring to. I can only imagine because there's plenty of CDC guidelines and in our state, state health department guidelines that just prohibit that. I think what should be meant by those comments and just speaking for what our, what the governor said is that there are many districts in our state that are still completely virtual. We know some within Western New York, right? They haven't had kids back at all. There's some districts downstate that have had kids checking in one day a week, giving them packets to learn from. Kind of like we had to in the emergency situation at the end of last year. That's all they've been doing. So I hope when he says that he means fully open so that students have an opportunity to participate and come to school like ours have been. Given the social distancing requirements, right? Given the you know, mask wearing, given all those things that we put in place. So I think, and I hope that that's what he means. I want families to know that I don't think and can't imagine that what he means in April, all of a sudden we're gonna have all of our kids back. We're gonna stop remote learning and everybody's gonna be walking back into the classrooms. That is not realistic. That's not happening. And I don't think that that's what he means, but it's left to, left so much to discussion that I think, you know, as a district, and I think many of the districts in our region have done a nice job of bringing our kids back, of making sure that they're still socially distanced, that um, I don't necessarily think he's referring to us when he talks about being open or more open, fully open. Does that answer that? Yes, very good. All right, we'll move on to the superintendent's comment then. We'll leave that or report. I will just lead right into that with- uh... Okay, thank you. Uh, first one, um, we, we're looking to um, change. So the first two items are calendar items. One's for this year. We're looking to flip flop an, an asynchronous day. Here's the thought. Um, we believe that the largest maybe number of students who might be in flux will be in the fourth quarter change, very possibly. Okay, assuming we can make it happen. Currently, we do not have an asynchronous day because remember, we were not going to allow that fourth opportunity for our families. Okay, currently we do not have an asynchronous day set up at what will be the change of the fourth marking period. So what I would like to propose is that we take May 3rd, which is currently an asynchronous day, and instead move that to April 19th. And then I think at the high school, middle school, currently um, that would mean that we would keep the red day because it's a red day, I believe. It would still be a red day on May 3rd. So we don't change the number of days. But the understanding and the reason being, it's that day to reset any and all of the students who are flip-flopping back and forth between programs, giving an opportunity for elementary kids to meet a teacher if they're going in or out, to understand how to use the technology, if they're going out to remote, right? We want that, that time has been really important for families and for staff to make sure that that's as smooth a transition as we can make it. So interested in your thoughts on that. I, I see no problem with that. How about the rest of the board? I'm good with it. I'm yeah, good with it. Yeah, fine by me. 
Okay, with it. I, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with our um, cognitive learning team, not that that group's job was determined which days, because we're still having the same number of days, but I'll, I'll, I'll share that. It just seems like something that'll make sense for everyone involved during those switch, during that switch. And then next board meeting, we'll make sure, if you're good with it before that, it sounds like you are, we'll get something out to communities, plenty of time uh, for them to make an adjustment to, to the school community, okay? Um, next is our school calendar. And I was hoping um, we could put that up. Hmm. Great, thank you. So if you scroll all the way down to the bottom for a moment, as a district, we have 187 teacher days in our calendar, okay? The regional calendar that comes from the four um, BOCES in our surrounding area had a calendar almost identical to this, which is some, something very important that we keep with BOCES, okay, for a lot of reasons. But they had a, except they, had a, they have 189 on theirs because of a couple of the BOCES. So what it means is each year we have to add two years into uh, the off, we have to take two days off of our calendar. Let me say it that way. What I plugged in, but certainly up for discussion, I plugged in November 24th and November 20 and December 23rd. Those two days, and you can see them there, were not on the BOCES regional calendar. They would be the two days I would recommend that we put into our calendar. I will tell you that people have been very used to the day before Thanksgiving off, especially if they have an opportunity next year to travel, unlike you know this past year. Um, we, we can all hope that that's the case. And then the day before um, uh, the 24th of December would be the other day. Thoughts? Yeah, I heard uh, with, with the Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving, I've heard nothing but positive comments from uh, teachers and staff. You know, they get an opportunity to cook and bake, not work the night before. You know, I haven't heard much on the Christmas thing, but I would think it would hold true the same there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the two days when I, when I sent it to the superintendent recommending that they be placed also because I just, you know, with family time, you know, being at a premium lately with, you know, holidays and hopefully we're back to some semblance of normal by that time. I mean, they have those days before, obviously we know what Christmas is like, you know, trying to get ready for the, the 20, the, even the 24th where a lot of people celebrate um, with Christmas Eve. It's, it's great to have that day off before both of those. Yeah, I'm totally up, agree with you. It's end of the year is probably the best time to have it. Hopefully we're back to some semblance of normalcy. I think I think it makes sense uh, placing them there. I don't know numerically, but I'm sure they are not traditionally high attendance days if school was in session. Good point. Yeah. Yep, sounds good to me. I mean, unless we we're putting them to have two weeks at Easter, um, <clears throat> you know. Keep on Keep fighting trying. for that one, don't you? Yeah, you try, try every year. year. You try every year. <laughs> so, so what I'll do is we'll get this into like a non-draft format, and I'll bring it back to our next uh, meeting then, okay? Hey, Dan, can you yes. explain, because it's new this that year, is uh, June 20, 20th? Yeah, yeah. So the 20th is actually in observance of Juneteenth. It is going to be a, it's a state holiday officially next year. And the observance day, if it's on a Sunday, would be the day after. If it's on the uh, 18th, it's the day, the day before. So I think like this year, so I will tell you this, this year it is not considered, um, what, they didn't put it in as a holiday for our current school year. It is something that I know some districts are talking about. I, I, it was just went out to our superintendent's group on Tuesday. I, I'll share that with all of you. I figure at the next meeting, after we get an idea of who's doing what with that day this year, um, if anything. But next year it becomes a state holiday. Steve, I appreciate that. You you just want to celebrate my birthday, don't you? 
It is, yes. Yes, we all do. <laughs> Especially Mike. Yeah. <laughs> okay, th Dan, thanks. You can take that down. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next item, you know, is a, I think a nice one for some, maybe a little bit of discussion and maybe it's even something that people think about when we talk about next meeting because we don't have a ton of things yet to do this with. But um, Julie actually brought to me um, the idea of, you know, can we try to do something in a unique way for recognition for our students? Um, you know, as a board, uh, you've recognized students in person, you know, historically. Um, obviously, we're in a little different world that we're living in right now with Zooms. So, you know, what are some creative ways that maybe we can um, uh, do this? And I know Julie wanted to bring it, bring it to the group. I'm certainly for coming up with some ideas. Um, if you're comfortable, maybe a couple of us talk on the side, come up with brainstorm a few ideas, bring it back to the group and we can talk about it at our next meeting. I know we have a number of different uh, kind of honors, awards, things that will be coming up soon so that right afterwards we can honor, including our January graduates. Does that, Julie, does that kind of sum up? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one of the nicest parts of being on this board is the recognition piece that we get to, you know, bring people in. I mean, we don't get cookies at all this year, but, you know, or punch. no punch. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that we keep that connection with our students, let them know how proud we are of them and their accomplishments. And, you know, I think we can get creative and find ways to, you know, still present them with those awards and those recognitions in a safe way. Right. And not even just students, but I mean, we all, we do recognize staff and we recognize, you know, other, other yeah. areas in the, within the district. So I, again, I think it's important. We keep that connection and everybody's working so hard, obviously behind the scenes, but you know, it would be good to acknowledge those things. It's really good. I think, and I think to your point too, I mean, you know, like our people retirees and stuff, we, we've, we put that off hoping we could get them right. in this year and it just hasn't been the same. So maybe we come up with some different way to do that. Right. And, you and can maybe, drive the maybe, school maybe, bus. Well, maybe you can drive the bus. Like this, we could drive around and deliver them. We could do yes. a number of different things, right? <laughs> yeah. Allison, she, I think she got her license. Steve has been looking for that <laughs> for years. So I love it. I love it. Let's do it. John's retired. I mean, he needs to get his license for the district. <laughs> so, um, Next for me, I have under athletics, um, the winter season is um, boys and girls basketball, boys and girls ice hockey, February 1st to March 27th. So really all of February, all of March. The fall two season, which is boys and girls volleyball, football, cheer, girls swimming is March 22nd to May 15th. And then the spring is track, baseball, softball, boys and girls lacrosse, unified basketball, and wrestling. And that's May 10th to June 30th. Okay. Um, I know that the, the, that June 30th date sounds really late, and it is. Um, I think depending on whether or not there are regents exams would determine maybe what they would have to do with that season you know, around readings exams. So if readings exams go away, I think it's a lot easier to extend that season out a little bit more. And they have also given permission for students to play or participate in contests beyond the graduation date. So if the graduation date was, say for example, the 24th, if a game took place on the 26th, they were still eligible to continue playing up until the 30th. Thank you. Great point because it's really important because if we are in the similar boat than we were as we were last year, graduation dates were all over the place, right? Usually they're compact within a five day, you know, seven day schedule. Last year they were 20 days in between mm -hmm. graduations in some cases. So, good point. Dan, do low risk sports coincide with the winter season's end date? Do low risk, let me just look at the date here. Hold on. Like bowling and the other whatever else is going on at the time right now they'll, they'll be done before that because they had an earlier start okay i, yeah, I just didn't know they, they, i, they they I just didn't know february, if they're right i think the end of february i think might be yes okay that's right i don't have that down here that date sorry 
Um, last but not least, I put this on here all the time. Um, food service, just a reminder to our school community, you can pick up uh, breakfast and lunch daily uh, at our high school campus and high school middle school campus right between the two. And it, it doesn't matter um, whether you're in attendance or not. If you're virtual, you can come and grab that food. Uh, students who not in attendance, it's just, it's grab and go. And um, we certainly uh, want our families to take advantage of it uh, because it is there. Thank you. Any questions to the superintendent with his report or any of the item there or any other questions to the superintendent you wish to ask now? All right, um, report to the board. We have uh, finance listed there, but there's nothing under it. Is there anything that's coming through in finance? Yes. Okay. I have actually several things to discuss tonight. So the first thing we'll talk about is the tax cap calculation. So if you could bring that up, please. Okay, um, let me just um, emphasize this is only an estimate at this point, and I'll explain why as we go down. Um, this is the same calculation as always. You start with the prior year tax levy, which is in the current year now, multiply it by the tax based growth factor, which is provided by the state. Base your pilots. So that 1.731 number there is not what I put in the calculation last year. And I will explain why later that I had to change that. And I still have to go back to the state and, and figure out what to do because I believe I have to go back and correct last year's. That has to do with our pilots and how uh, the towns and the uh, counties are handling them. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, but that gets added in and then you deduct your capital expenditures net of aid for the current year. Multiply that by your uh, levy growth factor. Again, that's provided to us by the state. And then you subtract out the budget year pilots, that 1.813 number, and add in any available carryover, which we do not have. Um, and the tax levy limit before exclusions is $33,255,628. And then I can add in any exclusions. We don't have any torts or ju judgments and our capital expenditures net of aid um, uh, anticipated for the following school year is uh, just over a million, 1.4 million. That, that brings our tax levy limit plus exclusions to $34,719,000. $719,716 or 1.99% over prior year. It's all, it's a difference of about $676,000. Um, getting back to the pilots, um, some of these pilots have expired and it's up to the towns to put them back on the tax rolls and they're not doing it. I don't know why. But I can tell you, I'm very frustrated because every year when I go through this calculation, my tax collector, Becky, that works for us, and I talk about the expired pilots. And frankly, it's not our job to go back to the town and the IDA and say, why aren't these back on the tax rolls? The IDA comes up with these agreements and they have, they drop any responsibility after that. And, you know, they, they should be going to the towns and saying, these pilots are now expiring. They need to go back on the tax rolls. These things greatly affect our tax cap calculation. So that 1.813 number there that you see that we have in the budget for 21-22, there's a 200, over $210,000 swing in our tax cap, depending on if some of these pilots get put back on the tax rolls. I'm estimating at the high end, assuming they're going to do what they're supposed to do, put them back on the tax rolls. But if they don't, it lowers our tax cap. So if we could go as low as 1.37%. I mean, that's a huge swing. And I, don't, I really don't understand why the towns are not putting these back on the rolls after they're expired, knowing how it affects our tax cap calculation. But that's why I'm telling you right now, this is only an estimate because we're trying to get answers back from the IDA on whether or not these are going back on the tax rolls. He, uh, the person that we um, 
communicate with has actually communicated. It, they're all in one town and communicated with that town assessor asking her to put them back on, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. So the scary thing is like even that one from prior year now, it went up to 1.7 because that's what we actually collected. But what we anticipated to collect was about 1.4. And that was because again, those there was a, at least four pilots that did not go back on the tax rolls that had expired. So now I have to go back to the prior year tax cap calculation and make sure that it's not gonna affect us um, exceeding the cap which could be a problem in the future because then I'd have to work with the state to figure out what to do if we've exceeded the cap without a without the vote, without a supermajority vote, basically. It's a real problem. And I, you know, I, I don't know what else to do at this point. <laughs> but I mean, I'm doing the best I can with the information I have. So I'm just letting you know right now, this is an estimate. This is where we're at. Um, but that's what's affecting this calculation so much as the pilots. Let me ask you, Allison, can, you said there were several uh, pilots. Can, can you create a list of what pilots are finished that should be back on the tax roll? Yeah, we actually have the list because we sent it to the IDA and asked them why they weren't back on the tax rolls. And can you were, uh, break it down well, I guess you wouldn't have to break it down by town, but uh, does this list specify what town? Yes, and, and uh, they're all for one particular town. Uh, what town? Um, it's town of Wheatfield. Oh, okay, so there's nothing that town residents need to do uh, to uh, town of Niagara. It's all Wheatfield. It's all Wheatfield right now. I mean, it's happened before in other towns, it just so happens this year, it's all town of Wheatfield. Can, um, um, can we'll say members of the board who live in the Wheatfield district call their town assessor or supervisor mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ask what is going on and something like that? I mean, they're not gonna listen to Rick Sirianni from the town, but that's why I was interested in the town. But if there's none from the town of Niagara, uh, can, our people who live in there, and these politicians have to answer to, um, bring that up, not to add work to our board members. I just don't know any other way to do it. Sure, I don't think that would hurt, yeah. I'm happy to do it, I'll do it. I mean, let's put it this way, and it, it's, no, I better not say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, like no, that. Good. no, very good, why don't, why don't we do this, Allison, if you would, why don't you send the list to let, send the list to me. I'll share it with the board, and sure. then um, they could certainly reach out. So if they have some, you know, the information in their hands is talking points. Right. Sure, I can do Sounds that. Good. Okay, so that's where we're at with the tax cap. Um, can I make one more comment about the tax cap? So I believe the next meeting, right, Allison? We need to vote on the tax cap. Correct. So just because we have a, a, a there's deadlines there, so. Um, Everybody give some thought to, to the tax cap with the highest number being 199. The next um, meeting, maybe we'll know a little bit better if it's moved anywhere. It, I only see it moving in a negative direction, correct, Allison? Yes. Okay, so, so give some thought to this number here. And the one thing I just say every year with regard to the um, going to the whatever the cap number is, and we can show you next time if you'd like um, what the cap's been. We always have that slide, what the cap's been versus where we went to. Um, that when you don't go to the cap, you can never get that, that money back. Okay. So it's uh, never what, something what, you could... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were No, nope, that's it. Good. Go ahead, Rick. If, Allison, just hypothetically, if, if, um, if Wheatfield did add some of these things back on a tax roll, would that tax cap number go up or down? It, it would go up. It would go up. Okay. Allison, Allison, how many how many are there that are that are off? I, I can't remember exactly. There's four or five, I believe. Possibly six. 
Well, Alice, did, did you say that, that that tax cap, though, you calculated with those going back on the rolls, right? So Correct. 199 is the maximum it would go All this right. year. Okay. All yes, right. that's the max. Yeah. So if they don't go back on the rolls, I have to right. put that in the calculation. It actually lowers the cap. And right. when do they got to go back on the rolls back? Well, for the net, they have to add them to the tax rolls so that when we issue the um, levy, it's uh, they're on the tax rolls instead of on a pilot. So well, for our purposes, it has to be by months. next meeting. Oh. I'll have to know by next meeting if they're going to do it. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they necessarily do it either. I'll be honest, because last year we expected them to go back on and they didn't. So <laughs> was last year's also just town of the Wheatfield or was it all the towns? Um, I believe I'll have to check, but I think it was just town of Wheatfield as well. Okay. I think it's the same ones, you know, the same four or five. And, you know, and, you know, again, I just want to add in, you know, when, when these pilot uh, agreements are made through the IDAs, the schools have no say. We, we have no say in this at all, you know, as to how they're created, how they're put together, the dollar amounts, nothing. I think the IDA should take some responsibility on these and say, you know, they're expired and go to the town and at least remind them or whatever they have to do to say, please make sure they get back on the tax rolls. And if they're not, they should be informing us, but we're actually doing all the legwork for yeah. them, to be honest. Yeah. So that's not the town IDA though, that's the, the county IDA, correct? That's that put these in place? I, right, because I don't think the town of Wheatfield doesn't have their own IDA. No, town of Niagara so does, but town of Wheatfield does not. So it's a mm -hmm. county IDA. Uh, just to let you know, Allison, Town of Niagara just disbanded the Town of Niagara IDA. Oh, okay. Just in the last two months. So then there is only the county IDA. Yes. Okay. At, at least it's not involved in a Town of Niagara. I don't know about every other town, but. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, uh, the current year budget. Okay, so going back to what um, Mr. Lilanich discussed earlier, the fund flexibility, actually the, uh, the state um, had a, what did they do? They put in a authorization for school local governments and school districts to spend or temporarily transfer monies in reserve funds for COVID-19 pandemic related expenditures. So we have had a great need for technology devices as you can well imagine. Um, I'm asking if the board would authorize, I have to put together a resolution for this, but if we could use um, up to, I think it's $200,000 for about, we're looking to spend about $200,000 for about 400 Chromebooks. Um, COVID obviously has resulted in increased need for devices for students so that they can engage in instruction away from home as in, is the case for virtual as well as hybrid instruction. Um, <clears throat> devices that were previously shared in the classrooms are no longer available because they've been handed out basically. Further, the average life expectancy for devices that are not used in the classroom, uh, classroom settings is significantly lower due to the added usage. And doing this would help sustain the existing inventory as the needs due to COVID-19 have exacerbated the need for technology. Uh, we currently have one active capital reserve for capital projects. Uh, it's the 2019 Capital Reserve, which was approved for a $6 million funding level. To date, we've only uh, funded a portion of that, about uh, just over $1.6 million. So we can fund up to uh, an another $4.3 million around there to reach the $6 million limit. We've utilized um, $1.14 million of that $1.6 that we put in, and that was for this current $30 million uh, project. We have a balance of $558,739 in that reserve. 
I'm asking if the board would consider using $200,000 to put towards technology devices because we have to have some sort of sustainability plan. <clears throat> and I've been working real close with Jeff Hazel to put one together. And <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Just over the last obviously year, the amount of increased usage and need for those devices has gone up considerably. So there's no extra devices. Everybody's got something in their hands. And some of these devices are old to the point where they're going to not be supported by BOSIs anymore. So we have to start looking at turning them over. My concern is the amount that we need right now. I don't know that I could support it in next year's budget. Um, I, would, I would rather try to take advantage of this now um, and utilize some of this capital money because it is COVID related in the current year. And if we do have a fund balance, again, I can put the money back into that reserve because um, we still have about 4.3 million that we can build on. We, you know, we're in the middle of a $30 million capital project as far as capital projects go. I'm not sure that we're looking to do anything right away again. Um, we're still working in this one. So we'd have time to build that reserve as well as others if necessary. And I think it would be a good use of these funds, frankly. Could I just add one thing too? Um, you know, districts do have, and sometimes they'll name it a capital project um, uh, technology reserve, okay? And we, and we have it. And quite frankly, we, we've certainly seen because of COVID an increased need. I don't know that that need's gonna go away. I think we've seen this digital divide as a real problem for some families. And so, I mean, I can see a situation where we're, we, we have family members who, families who need them, using them after COVID, right? Because when kids go home and do homework, they're, they're not able to do it the same way if they don't have devices. So having that as an option um, is really important and we don't have that built in right now. And I, I would say afterwards, what we would probably do in future years is create um, one of two things. Either we create a separate capital reserve that would be just for technology and then we put money into that when there's additional funding or we always go in knowing that when we put money into a capital reserve, we can move it. But we, we wanna make sure, I think the other way might be better just because you have you don't have to worry about flexibility uh, with the state. And in this case, because it's COVID related, they've created more flexibility than in past years with how we spend. Hey, Dan, that additional savings we had, we can't trans use that, right? Is that, how's that work? You know- Oh, we were oh, oh, no, so, okay, good question. So, so Bob's question is, in other words, we had uh, money that we did not spend within the current project no right. you, no we cannot okay. either it's dedicated to the project or it would actually what would happen is that would end up sitting in a reserve as well the portion that we pay for remember some of that bond some of that money is going to be paid by the state as aid comes back in right. so um did i get that right allison yeah what well, we if you know we would end up spending it all but you know um if, if for whatever reason we didn't, it would go back into the taxpayers against the bond payments, the debt service. You know, Dan, you know, I would support even in this budget season, well, um, if we need it, we need it. But to create a line in this budget season moving forward, uh, an X amount of dollars, then we know we have to budget. And if, if really something gets bad, I guess we can always not fund it that particular year, but like our buses, Allison and Dan, do we get anything like state aid or BOCES aid back when we buy equipment like this? Like buses, we get 70, 80%. Do we get anything back equipment like this? Um, good question. I, I believe we, we, we usually do it as a project through BOCES. So we do get some aid. I'm not sure exactly how much I'd have to find out. Yeah, it, it's, not, it's, I'm sorry, it's not near the same rate, but it, it, we do get, we, 
Am I muted? No. No. Okay. Um, it was still saying I was muted. Um, <laughs> so, so important to note that we, it's not the same rate as we get buses, but absolutely. And, and Rick, if I could just back up to your initial point, that's what we've talked about. I mean, you know, moving forward, we need that built into our budget. What we've used every year is our excess dollars at the end of the year. Right. And that works to a degree until you get into a year where maybe you don't have excess dollars. Well, can so and, and I want to, I, I just want to jump in too and say we do currently budget for equipment and technology. So there already is a line in the budget. The problem is it's never enough. <laughs> I mean, we go through it, you know, big time. It's bumping that number up. Right. You know, when you fund it properly and and maybe with the thought process, even if we get three thousand dollars back from other computers or whatever number that is, that should on top of what we decide to do, go back into that budget line. Well, here's the thing the computers that we have, we actually lease them from BOCES. So it's a it's a lease agreement. We don't actually own them. Oh, so okay. when they die. And then even, even if we did, it wouldn't, we probably wouldn't get anything because they're basically used. Absolutely. Right. Well, I think we, I think Rick's referring to the aid though, that if you get the aid back on there, this goes back. Oh, the aid. Line. Well, yeah, the aid comes in as a, is, is a part of the foundation. You know, it comes in all well, together. It comes in as expense-based aid. Mm -hmm. Well, like that we talked about earlier. Well, so the, only a portion of it does. Right. The, the state aidable piece does, but we spend more than that on, the, the amount we get is, I'm, I'm guessing now, less than $100,000 a year for technology um, equipment from the state. So it's like $73,000 or something like that. It's ridiculously low. That, that doesn't buy anything. So Very it couldn't low. set up like the buses then? No, it's not set up like the buses. Couldn't be. Just, to re just to reiterate, you're looking for $200,000 for 400, 400 computers? Is that correct? Up to 400 Chromebooks we're going to try to buy. Is that, I mean, just offhand, aren't Chromebooks like two or 300 bucks or what? I don't know where you source from or what kind of spec'd out. You, you have to remember, you have to go through what the BOCES bid list is. And if that's what's listed on that bid list is that price, that's what's been approved. Right. So they so can't go I, any sort of cheaper option to, to source anything for cost savings? No, unfortunately, you couldn't go to Best Buy and pick up the $139 cup Chromebook that's on sale or Woot that's got the $99 one on sale right now. Right. And and wow. Jason, I think part of the problem with that is the, they, they and Steve could probably speak to this better, just his technology background, but, but I believe um, you don't get as many years of, of the updates, the cheaper the device. So, you know, what, what you're paying for with a little bit better devices that they're going to last a little bit longer and not well, be obsolete as soon. It, it's not just that price. Processing also, speed. You're, you're it built into that BOCES price is also a part, a part of it is the warranty that would go on to it, service. the extended warranty that they have that they, um, so if you so think they about service it, them and they do everything if yes. there's issues, that's how it works. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they build into their price that, that aspect of it. So think about getting the geek squad protection on it, you know, that's built into that with, the BOCES protection, you know, with the BOCES geeks. Yeah. Is the 400, um, is that a targeted number of people who have requested them at this point, or is that it, just a ballpark? It's the number that um, uh, Mr. Hazel has come up with that is a need at this point. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so you have a friend behind you. Um, I know, she's blocking me. <laughs> <laughs> she well, hey, Dan. Dan, with that 400, that how close are we to being a one-to-one -one district? Let me get you that number next. Can, week. can you oh, can you get that? Okay, because I mean that's that is not that's what the just, ultimate goal let me would clarify, be. Clarify that that's not adding devices. That's right. I know that's replacing, but I'm just yeah. I was curious about that anyways, and how close we are, because I mean, eventually with the way things are, I know, and where we need to go. I mean, that's the direction you and I have talked about it's, that that we really need exactly to have. Exactly the conversation that we that Mr. Hazel and I had as well. Yep, absolutely. That we need to get to the point where we're one to one. Not that we want to be that every day, but that we have the ability to. Yeah. So I mean, even so, even in school, I mean, you're gonna you're we're to the point now where our savings can be realized as we have these have Google Docs and so on, where you know you you put a little bit more money in the technology, your paper budget goes down. 
because you are no longer using sure. hard copy for many different things. So if you could get me the, you know, where, where we are, oh, how close that. we are to that. Yeah. Happy to. So I, okay. Allison, what's the turnaround time with the, on those computers? I mean, they back ordered, we looking for this school year, next school year? I'm looking to actually do it this school year. Um, and it would be a project through BOCI. So it would be something that they would have to order and hopefully we'd get it before the end of the school year. If not, we would get it for the next school year. But I'd like to do it in this school year. Is this, yeah. and you're saying this is to replace units? To replace. Mm -hmm. It's to and replace just, units that are gonna be obsolete starting next year. What's that? It's gonna replace units that will be obsolete next year. Okay. Uh, and the we did five hundred ago. Is that the same thing? Or we added that, right? Those are additions that we just did. Yes, we did. We did add this year. We yeah. bumped it up. That's right. Just out of curiosity, what is the lifespan that the ones that we're replacing? How how long have we had those? That's a good question. Five years. Five years. Say four or five years, maybe. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. No. That, that that's about right. Well, I'll, I'll give you that too, Jay. We'll get that. So just so you can see. You know, okay, the, what happens is it. puts it out and says, you, you, at this point, you're no longer going to get updates. They're, and right. once those devices stop updating, they're useless. And then you get, inf uh, you know, virus and all that stuff. And we don't. No longer protected, yeah. right. So what iPads are great with uh, having to worry about those kinds of things. Um, <laughs> you didn't hear me say that. The, you know, the other thing, Jay, that when, when you see that price, it's, it's not just for the, the units themselves and, and the, the service piece. You got they, uh, they provide charging stations for them. So you get this giant cart. And it's amazing what the cost of that cart comes down to being. Because, uh, you know, if we're replacing machines five years ago, the form factors change, different models, whatever, you know, different manufacturers will not fit in the, the cart in which they just slide and lock into for charging, so you need to add that piece into it too. So, I mean, it bumps, $500 for a Chromebook is very, is very costly. It's, it's you know, it's, you know if you look at that, what the price of this would be, um, but you throw that cart in there, which could be for, let's say, if you could do 30 Chromebooks in a cart, that cart might be like two grand to three grand by itself. Right. It also includes yeah. the setup that we, we get charged from by BOCES, you know, to set up each of the devices. Mm -hmm. So Dan, are, are you asking for a motion on the 200 now or for a resolution? No, she needs to get a resolution together. She needs to get a resolution. Just I'm asking me, if the board would like me to draft a resolution for the next yeah. board. Can, before we get to that point, you know, we, we talked about money in there. You said about 200,000 from there. Is it possible to go a little bit higher with that amount of money so we could start a process of adding new machines, even if it was like another 30 or 40 so we can start that ball rolling? Sure. Can I suggest this? I think because this is just utilizing this one source. I think the rest of that is part of our budget planning right. for next year. Yeah, is but I'm saying like, if you, you wanted to try getting stuff into this current budget, you know, where we have is, you know, can we look at maybe not getting a few extra machines in there so that we know that we're gonna we're gonna need them at some point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think absolutely we will have additional, we've already talked about this, additional money in our technology budget line for next year's budget um, because of the, the, the need. So this is a this is in essence above that. So if we if we did the 200 machines going hitting on what Steve's talking about, just say that's an extra 10,000. Instead of buying the machines today, put that extra 10 in the budget line. Correct. Then what we could the get numbers? whatever you need. Got it. Yeah, so what would be the number next year? I mean, it would be 200 every year, is that what we're talking? Or? No, if you're going to start yeah, adding so machines, you're going to have five years is 2,000 devices, and you know, we're looking at targeting about 3,000 kids, right? So, right, plus turnover, so it would be like 200 a year just to turn over the machines right. we have. Can I, can I make a suggestion that we do eventually form a capital pro a project line for, for computers and sort of start a turnover plan like the buses? Yeah, yeah, so move. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm suggesting we're not making, making a motion. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, well, I would put it on the I would put it on the budget vote for this year. For it has yeah. to be taxpayer voted on, so we can right. certainly add that. Sure. Because I really think we're seeing, and actually, it was ironic. I was just reading an article from NISBA that talked about how 
the technology, there's seven things that the, the, you know, that the, um, that the pandemic has now you know, exposed in education that are going to be staying and technology, the use of technology this way is, is one of those that is going to be probably staying, you know, I mean, the other ones, ironically, were not, not really much stuff with, uh, with instruction. It was, uh, you know, just how, uh, like, you know, hygiene, you know, that piece of hygiene and, you know, preparing to have hand washing stations and hand sanitizing stations throughout your buildings and stuff. Um, you know, that the technology piece is one that's not going away. It was like number, it was like number one or two that we're going to have to start, you know, thinking about funding for and thinking that just like, like I just said, the buses where it's, here's a plan of replacing things. I agree. I'm sure BOCES has a projection of when set number of machines are going to come up for off of lease. So, I mean, you can base your budgeting on, cause you're going to have bubbles yep. and you're going to have pitfalls depending now we've bought a lot of machines in the last couple of years. So, you know, down the road, five years, you're going to have a bigger hit. So. And, and we do have all that broken down, John. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Judge Jeff and Jessica have that broken down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're okay, I'll put a resolution together. For the next good. Meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Um, Next, um, as I'm putting together the budget for next year, actually um, in discussions with the facilities director, Mr. Phillips, we're talking about the um, vehicles. And we have some vehicles that are not going to pass inspection. Um, so again, as I'm putting the budget together, I'm asking the board if uh, they would um, like me to do to add uh, the vehicles in for that. So we have, well, let me start with this. We have uh, two capital transportation reserves, a 2017 capital transportation reserve and a 2018 one that are still open and have balances. Um, they're both fully funded. So at this point we can't, fund, we can't fund them anymore, but between the two, one reserve has uh, just over $572,000 and the other one has uh, just over 2 million. Um, as I said, we spend about $800,000, 810, I think I'm budgeting a year in buses. Okay. So, um, we have just over two years or close to three years for, for buses. Um, I'm asking if we could, um, spend up to no more than $250,000 of that for, facilities vehicles. We have, um, let's see, I have my list here. Somewhere. Um, there are, I think three, four trucks that need to be replaced. So um, we had a salt truck that's probably not going to pass inspection. Here's an example. It's, it's a, a 2006 dump truck that we use as a salter. It actually went down this year when we needed it to salt the lots. Um, so it had to go in for repair. Um, we've got two 2009 trucks and a 2009 van that is used strictly for food service. Those are the four trucks that we're looking to replace at this point. The vehicles are all over 10 years old and are no longer reliable. The maintenance on them is becoming it's heavy, heavy maintenance on them. The dump truck itself has a rotted frame and won't pass inspection. So we'll be short a salt vehicle if we don't replace that. And, and just, just a quick perspective too, you know, we have we're been replacing those vehicles over the past few years. Right. As, as the district is, as, as the ship has been righted when it comes to finances, but they're the ones at the bottom of that list. Those four are like the last ones that are really, really rough shape mm -hmm. that you know, they've Right, I've been trying to throw band aids. There are a couple other ones that are coming up, but these are the worst ones and they're all at once. And I don't, at this point, I can't see adding it into the budget next year. The budget won't support it. So, what I'd like to do is add it in and have it paid for with the capital reserve funds. Well, so, what I'm asking is as I budget, would it be all right if I added that reserve money in? because it has to obviously go to public vote as well. Um, and it would be a proposition on the, on the budget vote to utilize. Um, how, much do you think, how much are you saying for all three? 
There's four vehicles and it would be up to, up to $250,000, no more than $250,000. The most expensive one is the dump truck with the salter. Well, you know, we have to provide good work and safe vehicles for our employees. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, so I don't have a problem with it, but in, sh in certain vehicles, you cannot do this, but I'm not sure what all vehicles it's involved. Have we looked into leasing? I mean, you can't lease a dump truck for salt, but you mentioned a mail thing. Have we looked in leasing? Uh, can it save money if we leased one or two vehicles? I, I, I don't know. Well, I know that the town has got into leasing because of the money crunch, but I don't know if the school can. I, I actually have not looked into that. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I'd have to look to see what the mileage would be on, on the vehicles, if it would be worth it, um, frankly. Um, you know, we, we're using them for facilities people, the three of them, one is, one is for, um, the food service van, which is used a lot. I mean, he goes to every school once, twice a day, does bank runs, food runs, all that stuff. So I, I, I feel like the mileage on that one alone probably wouldn't be worth a lease. Um, you have to buy it outright. Hey, listen, they also do leasing where you basically, if you bought say 10 vehicles at the cost of 45,000 a year becomes 450, you can actually lease them by paying 150,000 per year over three years to budget better, but they all become yours at the end for say a dollar. That's the other leasing program that's out there for like police vehicles, which is probably what Rick's talking more like. Okay, yeah, we, I think we lease. leased some police vehicles and I don't know, usually after two years, three at the most, they're over a hundred thousand miles on. Yeah. But I don't know how it, can be changed over to the school district because I'm not sure what vehicles. I just asked if if we at least yeah. looked into something like that. Worth looking into. Yeah, we can look into it. I don't. I've never heard of it. So yeah, I, I have. I, I, yeah, I'm not aware of that um, particular program, but I'll certainly look into it. Well, I'm not asking. I, you know, maybe. No, I it's worth know. asking. It's a good yeah. question. That's a good question. Yeah. You probably you probably want to look at all your vehicles and see where you stand too when you. Like yep, we are. We we hit, we're tracking them. They, they, they have, have yeah they, they have that and you know like the, these older vehicles what happens is it, you can't find parts it costs more to put parts into them in a year you know it, it they're just and I would say you know the other piece if if we know that because of our mechanics because of they're taking care of that we're getting 12, 15 years out of these vehicles that's pretty good. Yeah. Yes. Okay, last thing, I promise, <laughs> is, um, tax collection. So we have a uh, lockbox at m and Bank that collects our taxes and they also do in-person tax collection. They've notified me that they will no longer do in-person tax collection. So meaning when people bring their tax bills into the bank, they pay for them with cash or check and they're no longer gonna be accepting that. Um, I have asked prior and I asked again, if they could put a lockbox outside the bank for deposits, they, they said, no, they won't do that. Um, the issue is it creates more work for the people in the bank, plus they don't want the people in the bank um, because they end up having to send it to the PO box that's on the tax bills because of the lock, because the lockbox is actually what collects our taxes. So whether someone pays them in person in the bank or not, they all go to their lockbox. So the people in the bank then put it in an envelope and have to mail it to the lockbox. So um, this year, I just did a little research. We m and collected 2,605 tax bills. That does not mean 2,605 people came into the bank because a lot of people come in with several bills. Um, agencies, mortgage companies, they come in and actually pay them in person sometimes and they come in with several. But that equates to about 23% of the 11,093 tax bills that we send out. 
Um, again, it's not 23.5% of the people because like she said, you know, some people come in with a lot, like a bunch of them sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna suggest um, right now we don't have uh, another bank to collect. Our other bank is JP Morgan. There are no, there are no um, in-person um, buildings for JP Morgan. It's all done via mail. Um, I'd suggest that we move to direct mail to collect all the taxes. Um, it's, we offer this now, it's, it's an option now, and it's the way the tax collection is set up, frankly. Um, there's no lock box. There is a lock box that people mail the taxes to. I would not suggest collecting in the district. We do not have any way to keep that amount of money to keep it safe, <clears throat> nor would I wanna put the people in any kind of jeopardy and collect it in the district. Um, what about with the various towns? Cause I mean, they obviously collect their own taxes at the town halls. What about? The town, in, I'll tell you in Erie County, the towns collect for the schools in Niagara County, they do not. So I don't know why <laughs> it's different but they don't collect for the schools. Um, we have to collect ourselves. So uh, it would be great if the towns would, would do that but um, it would have to be like one town because I can tell you like when I, I can I know when I worked at Williamsville the town of Amherst did all the collecting but the Williamsville school district was obviously in more than one town so they collected for all of the the entire school one town did so one town would have to do it to make it work but whether they want to do it whether they have the staff to do it I don't I don't know mm -hmm. um it's not a, the collection isn't really the problem. It goes to the lockbox. The only problem is that people are, you know, coming in person and paying in cash. And it's probably people that have been doing it for years. And I mean, well, they, I know that, that I can tell you that when M&T made a change about paying um, your, their taxes there, where if you paid by check, you could only pay by an M&T, I think it was m and an m &T check. Or oh, something, there's something like that. There's something when we when that piece there was a change it made that there was a big brouhaha with that um, with people. And I could just see this is going to be another issue if they're not allowed to pay by cash, you know, and have to send a, that in because that was what a lot of the people who complained about this change for some reason were people that pay by cash. Yeah, Allison, is it feasible to look for another banking institution, or are they all consistent on this? Um. I don't know that they're all consistent. I can tell you, I'm trying to think of the other bank that we worked with, HSBC stopped doing it for the same reason. Um, and we actually had, well, M&T was looking to drop it last year and we kind of talked them into keeping it another year. So they kept it for this year, but they're not, they're definitely not doing it next year. I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like most banks are moving to that only for a couple of reasons. One, they're limiting, they're um, looking at their staffing in person at the banks themselves. And they'd have to, they have to beef up their staff when tax season comes because of the people coming into the branch and it takes away from their other business. Um, this is just what I've been told by m and So, um, you know, and, and with probably with COVID, to be honest, they don't want all the bodies in the banks and they're trying to move away from all that. And, do it by mail instead. Um, I, I don't know if other banks, I mean, I could do an RFP for banking, but it doesn't guarantee that they're gonna collect in person. Um, I know um, Starpoint uses m and and so does Lockport. And I've talked to Lockport is definitely moving to all mail. Uh, they told me that today I don't know what StarPoint's doing. I don't know that they've made a decision yet. Now, would they mail them into you, Allison? No, they mail them into m and in a lockbox, but it's in a oh, different- they mail them to m &T, okay. Yeah, it's a different building. m and would still do the collecting. They just okay. won't do it in person. I got you. So the issue really comes down in this situation to people wanting to pay in cash. Right. Correct. Right. And, you know, 
if, if they're used to paying in cash, they can still go into the bank and get a check. Okay. With. They right. can take the cash in, get a check and have it made out to Niagara right. Weefield Central School District and just throw it in the mail. They can still do that. They just can't pay their taxes in person. Right. And it doesn't affect people who have their taxes in their mortgage. No. Nope. Because the mortgage companies usually pay that and they many times pay by check anyway because none of them are local. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I mean, whatever you need to do, I think in this situation that you feel best is what we really should just let you go by. I agree. Okay. Okay. That's all I have tonight. All right, and then we'll look for those resolutions then for the next meeting. Or whenever, I mean, whatever meeting she needs to do it in. It's one resolution. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Allison on that report? Nope. All right. Any old business at this time or items for board discussion? All right. Any new business? All right. Uh, public comments? And okay, nothing there. Board member comments, anything? I have something. I just want to say um, thank you to Marissa for kind of speaking up about what's going on in the building, you know, in the high school. And we totally feel where you're coming from and, you know, appreciate everything you guys are missing out on. So if there's anything, and I speak for myself and I would think everybody else that you think we can do to support you guys, I would love for you to, you know, bring that to us and, and we're here to support you just as much as you guys support us. So thank you for bringing that to us. And I, I feel so bad for you guys, but we'll figure something out. Yeah, well, thank you for helping. And I'll like, you know, I wanna keep like working with you guys and like obviously the rest of the class too to figure some things out. But yeah, so far, you know, do what we can, can do at least. Definitely. I know it's not easy for you to, you know, to like share that stuff with us because you don't want to seem negative or, you know, just kind of bummed, but, you know, we, we feel where you're coming from. So thank you. I feel a lot of those things are going to be dependent upon, you know, what happens with social distancing guidelines and it really is going to be driven by that anyway. So, yeah, you know, I so I, I was going to mention though, like, I know there were some new guidelines coming out in March for like weddings. I don't know if you guys saw any of that, but that's a very positive thing. I mean, the, the key with that is going to be the testing piece, but that's upwards of 150 people together. So I feel like we're moving in the right direction. We just have to be patient. And like we talked about, just have, you know, a bunch of different plans that we can work with. I agree. And Julie, I, I'd like to work with you on that recognition too. Okay. You got it. Okay. I mean, it's not just me. I, I brought no, it. I know, I know, but I like to be involved. Yeah. In it. So. Oh, but what I think we could do uh, and I, afterwards we can talk, but I'll, I'll set up like yeah. a little share. Maybe we can then talk and brainstorm some ideas. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Marissa, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that with us. Uh, we do understand where you're going the year that you've gone through. It's, something I don't think anybody would believe, but we, we're living it now. So just keep it up. We'll get to the final. Hopefully it'll be nice at the end. Yeah, well, thanks for listening. I don't want to seem like, I know it's only like one year, like it's okay, but you it's know, a tough yeah. mention it. <laughs> yeah, and don't downplay what you're going through. Yeah, it's a tough you, one. You guys all deserve a, a magical senior year. Everybody works so hard. It's like the culmination of your, you know, yeah. education. So don't downplay it. You know, no. you, deserve, you deserve it. And it's, it's a short time of your life. I mean, it's a, it's a time of your life where it's, you know, you take those things, you know, a lot of the students I've talked to, you know, they learn to not take things for granted right now with the way, the way things are going on. And, you know, so you know, obviously that senior year is important, you know, until you're Rick and Bob's age where every, every day is a senior what? year. Um, you know, I thought you would have said Rick. Go ahead. I said Rick and Bob. <laughs> you heard it right, Bob. You heard it right. <laughs> but you, you know, it, it's and obviously things. I, you know, the 
it, it, we talk about what's going on with our seniors now. I talked to some of our yeah. former graduates are still in college and they still have yet to experience college. <laughs> you know, they're they're still virtual with their colleges and haven't been on campus. So obviously that um, one of my one of my one of former students you know came back to to uh, he he messaged me one of the zooms we visit he visited me via zoom um, you know from his his uh, from his house and we we're talking about things and he says it's funny he says it's one of those few few years he says you know the fest, the freshman fifteen is not going to be from going to college it's going to be stuck in the house because it's being stuck in the house because of pandemic <laughs> he says it's turning the freshman thirty because of that so um, you know it's yeah it's 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 obviously hard uh, and, and I hear the frustration you know just not just the students the parents too you know they they don't know what's going on and you know everyone has an opinion about what what would be best and. The thing is what people don't realize, and this comes back to when the superintendent asked answered my questions earlier and stuff, you know, school districts don't have that autonomy to just say, hey, we're going to go against the go against the governor and go against New York State and do our own thing. You know, we have to follow our all the guidelines that are presented to us. So, you know, we just hope keep hoping that those guidelines change and give us more direction as time progresses. So any other uh, any other comments? Yeah, I just want to add, uh, Julie, if you need any help or anyone with the recognition, I'm available as well. Um, Marissa, I know what you're going through. I have a 2020 grad in my house who is home from college and has been, and she's excited because she has to go get COVID tested to get back on campus. So she's hoping she can get back on campus. So uh, again, like like was said, don't downplay it. Uh, strive for the best you can get by the end of the year. And, you know, everybody's here to work with you, not against you. And, you know, hopefully get a, a nice ending to the school year. I know it's it's been rough for everybody. Uh, I just want to add that um, I did attend the legislative breakfast. Um, a lot of good information, uh, good presentations by Dan, Paul Cassari, and Mark Laurie. And I was happy to see that the uh, lawmakers were there present to hear the message and hopefully they do take that back to Albany and do take it with um, a bit of uh, intensity and kind of fight for what we really need as a school district. And it's not just our school district, it's across the state. I mean, just the, the funding and what's been done with the COVID aid and the stimulus and stuff. So I just wanna thank getting the invitation for that, that it was certainly worth the time sitting in on that. That's it. All right. Any other board members? If not, then I'd like to call for a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. I'll, I'll second it. it. Um, all those in favor, then please say aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Motion carries. We're adjourned.